next panel now is going to be moderated by Tracy Ann Michael. And Tracy Ann is a Jamaican curator based here in Lagos and in Amsterdam. Her work focuses on diasporic blackness, place making and community building. She has worked in the field of art and culture as a researcher, moderator and educator in a number of institutions, including the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. In Lagos, she served as lead facilitator of the first Artist Accelerator program by 1952 Africa dedicated to the support and development of young African artists. And she's currently curator in residence at the experimental art space, The Tree House. So Tracy Ann, the floor is yours. And please, the other panelists. Thank you, Marit. Um, thank you for putting together such an interesting program about such an interesting topic. And I've really uh, enjoyed the previous conversation. Thank you, Wale, and all the panelists. Um, there, are, there are really so many different points that came up from the, the previous panel that really touched on these different issues related to restitution, restitution of objects, and restitution otherwise. And it, it feels as if, in some sense, you know, what, we, what can we also add? Um, but I think that in, there is always more to be said, more to be discussed. And I am also hoping that we will also get a chance to give you as an audience um, a lot of time also to come into this conversation with us as, as we also did in the previous panel. So definitely afterwards we'll be having a conversation too um, with all of you who are here um, to really, this is such an important topic. So thank you for really putting this together. I'm happy um, to have with us um, such a diverse panel. I was really quite happy to, to see, uh, you know, just a different, different sets of persons from different viewpoints that we're going to be talking with on this panel today. And um, first we have um, beside us Brenda Fashubba, um, who is the head of arts um, and the regional lead for the creative economy um, Sub-Saharan Africa at the British Council. Um, she has spent well over a decade working as an arts manager and professional arts administrator with a focus for theater and festivals. And she was also a pioneering producer of the Lagos Theater Festival, developing it for over five years to become the largest outdoor festival in West Africa. In 2015, she created a focus group known as Women in Arts, providing a network platform for women. And the project launched its first festival showcasing female creatives in 2019. And she also co-founded the Lagos Fringe that year. So we're very, very happy to have Brenda here with us on the panel. And beside Brenda, we have Fisayo. Um, Fisayo Bakker is an independent curator, researcher, and art management professional who lives and works in Nigeria. Through her practice, which focuses on evidence-based ethnographic research, she adopts the use of quantitative and qualitative research methods to support cultural policy. She actively contributes to the academic community in Nigeria with a specialized curriculum focused on pre-colonial art history. Her recent work for the Lagos State Government engaged with cultural policy and the creative economy in the area. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, last but not least is Matthew Blaze. And Matthew is a non-binary, openly gay, award-winning LGBTQ plus rights activist. They've dedicated their life and work to confronting the violence towards gender non-conforming persons and queer people in Nigeria by creating safe spaces for the LGBTQI plus community, advocating for queer rights through online and in-person events, and mobilizing actions. Matthew is the founder of Obodo, a youth-led organization that is focused on advancing queer education and rights in Nigeria through innovative mediums like art, tech, and outreach. They are recipient of the 2021 MTV EMA's Generation Change Award, the SOGIESC Activist of the Year Award as well for 2020. So we're very happy to have, as you can see, a diverse, interesting panel with us here today. And for those of us who were here earlier and who have really um, also listen to the great um, speech or lecture by Maretta at the beginning and into the panel, would know that we're talking about restitution and we're talking about restitution of these objects which are very much a part of the debate. 
But I also thought that maybe it would be interesting for us to think through the restitution otherwise a little bit more in this panel. Um, because while it is that we're thinking about these objects, we're also very much thinking about the time that these objects were taken and what else was taken at this time, right? What else was changed at this time? What else was disrupted at this time? And, and the kind of violence that came with this change and what may it look like to have a sort of restitution or reparation um, or a repairing around, um, around the objects in some sense are a kind of vehicle through which we can have these other conversations. So while we'll be talking about objects somewhat, I want us to also be thinking through what does it mean to restitute? What does it mean to repair um, along, this, um, along these lines as well? So big question to ask. Um, I, I wanted to actually start out with you, Fizayo, for, because, you know, as a historian, as a sort of, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, maybe I love, I, I'm also an ethnographer, um, so I come from, from that um, viewpoint as well, but you are, it's the, your practice is interesting because you're using ethnography, but you're also very much a scholar of pre-colonial times, right, which in itself is something that you can sort of be a participant observer in now. So I guess my question is, I'd love to, to kind of think about what are we really looking to restore? You know, when you look into these colonial times, what, what, what comes to your mind when you say, okay, this is what, we're re what we have lost. This is what we're looking to re repair, to restore. Thank you for your question. I think um, stories are what really trigger me and trigger my imagination. And we have to take within the context of these artifacts and these art objects. Um, I started my research with the story where it first started, um, or where it first happened, and I tried to recoin it in a Nigerian or a Benin context. So I'm going to read what kind of formulated my um, trajectory through the uh, research process. On Saturday, January 2nd, 1897, that's 126 years ago, Oba Ovarwer, sorry, I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, because I'm Yoruba and it's, it's not. Ovorangwe, Nogwesi. Um, it's very important to say the first and the last name as well. Research will bring that up and labeling will also kind of help us to reconstruct the narrative. Of the ancient Benin Empire was performing rites at the annual Igwe festival, which is a peace festival, um, when the royal palace was visited by six British soldiers who were sent by the colonial administration on trade ex expeditions, right? So we had visitors at the palace. When James Phillips, the deputy commissioner and council of the Niger Coast Protectorate, so this was pre-Nigeria, it was not, it was just a geographical location. Um, when James Phillips was told that the Oba could not see him because a religious festival was taking place, he violated protocol which cost him his life. In a bid to avenge Phillips' death, the British sent 1,200 soldiers in February. So it took a month for them to move from coast to coast. It took a month, um, so they were sent in February. They came and arrived in February to take revenge. This is the foundation of the punitive military expedition and loot of the ancient Benin Kingdom. So now that we have that context, why are we fighting to have these objects back? I'm not sure if I've deviated from your question. Okay, sorry. And so that's kind of what formulated this train of thought for me. It's like, why? Why do we need them? I've had the opportunity to see the plaques in um, the British Museum several times. Um, I've seen some of the relics in the MC Shillon Museum where I um, am a partner curator. Um, I've worked on programming for secondary school students, which is available on the website um, for everyone, but it's taught in person to select um, public schools um, in the secondary school level because it's been removed from the curriculum as an elective. It's, it's, it's in there as an elective. It's been removed as a mandatory course of study. That, mo that distinction needs to be said as well because a lot of people are saying it's been sponged out, it's been removed, not quite. It's there, but it's not mandatory for you to take it. Um, and I think with the work I'm doing is trying to reorganize our thoughts and to safeguard our collective cultural memory. And so it's very important with the words that we use to 
document and to dialogue and to converse. Um, the root of this thing needs to be balanced as far as the equation so that the power tussle is not dependent on the Western world or the world of the looter. It's more balanced to say, hey, hang on a minute. This is a thing of justice and we need our items back because they rightly belong to us. However, we intend to use our own property, that is our business. And so that is where I tether on and in safeguarding just the memory and the narrative of how this whole restitution debate or discussion is governed. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. And I think it's, 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 it's great to put that story on the table um, because sometimes you know, we have this conversation about restitution um, and, and, and even when we talk about histories, right, there's a way in which the histories can seem so far away, so impersonalized, and also the simple, the reason, not, not a simple reason, the important reason for why in that moment, right, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, any invasion can result in, in you sort of responding, but you're saying that there's a particular reason why there was a, a, a strong response in that moment, and I think it's nice to also put that on the table, that we remember the story, because storytelling is a big part of, of, of the, our ways of telling histories regardless, you know? Um, you know, Brenda, I, I know that, you know, in, in some sense, it's a difficult position, um, but thank you so much <laughs> for, for being here um, as a representative of the British Council. Um, you know, I mean, I think in, 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 in some sense, there's a way in which you, you straddle, right? You know, both your own, your own, your personal histories, um, the, you know, just, or even just as someone growing up between places, um, that understanding um, the different viewpoints, but also having to work within an institutional context. And I, and I mean, I guess my, you know, my question is, for the British Council, or even um, maybe from, from that institutional standpoint, what are the kind of conversations or the kind of thinkings that are happening um, with regards to, again, thinking about restitution, not necessarily about objects, but even, you know, you're saying that, you know, how can we think and talk and tell stories around um, these ideas differently? What are the kind of um, questions that are happening in the British Council that acknowledge that wrong was done? How can we, what kind of restitution is happening now through, through the work? Um, of the British Council. Good evening. So I don't have this nice context, the contextual story to tell, but I will tell you how we work, you know, and hopefully maybe you'll be able to find some, uh, would I say, some, just forgive us, basically, <laughs> you know. Um, so I work as the head of arts for Nigeria and I lead on creative economy for Sub-Saharan Africa. That's about uh, 19 countries or so, you know. Um, but my colleague, um, who sits in Kenya, leads on what we call culture response, mm -hmm. you know. And culture response, you know, when you listen to culture response, just culture response, it means culture is responding to different things, you know, from climates to conversations around culture to competitions around this so it's like culture for inclusive growth you know mm -hmm. and under it because it's so wide it's so varied and nicely funded mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um that's the vehicle mm -hmm. that the british council uses to kind of participate you know in some of these conversations that can be uncomfortable mm -hmm. because we all live on a, in a planet where people are now responding to colonial history, you know, and you can see around the world what has happened in the last two years, you know, mm -hmm. even down to personal opinions being expressed, people are bringing out statues, people are changing street addresses and all of those things. And one particular part of this program for cultural response is something called New Narratives. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because, for example, um, creative economy works, it's almost um, the science, you know, mm -hmm. you're trying to support people skills, you know, hopefully um, improve livelihoods and all of those things. So, but for cultural response and with the new narratives, it's a more emotional response, if you would like, you know, and an example of a new narrative, if I was going to use something very, very simplistic, would be um, 
Africa is not a country, mm. you know, which is something a lot of people have started talking about when people say, I'm going to Africa, and everybody will be like, Africa, where are you go? Mm -hmm. Africa is, you know, 54 countries. So um, things like that. And usually the outputs from that kind of work after doing research comes like in podcasts, mm -hmm. in uh, blogs, you know, stuff where, first of all, we're acknowledging that there's a challenge around the narratives, you know, um, cross country, that is UK, Nigeria. And we're also looking at ways to change it. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about the new narrative program, which I enjoy, it is not sitting as a program like how I run Green Economy. Mm -hmm. It's like the way we work. Mm -hmm. So it's now part of even organizationally, you know, in terms of our processes and all of that. If you've worked in uh, Majesty's government, you'll know that bureaucracy is, can be a challenge, you know. And so we're talking about it in the ways we work, in the ways where work, even our grants work, the way we're examining applications, as simple as that, mm -hmm. to say, what kind of narrative do we want to put out there? You know, and when you contextualize it locally, you're looking at um, inclusion for women, mm -hmm. you know, disability arts, you're looking at work that transcends stereotypes, mm -hmm. you know, and so, in that regard, we've had um, support for conversations around institution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this work is going, on, uh, going along in East Africa because mm -hmm. it just feels like they've got um, kind of like a handle on it. Mm -hmm. And because we are limited in resources, we start from you know, a region of the continent. And so last year, we, we supported a symposium you know, where we were talking about decolonizing institution, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, and the results from of those from some of those conversations would just be as simple as acknowledging that something went wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, acknowledging that okay, we need to start talking about returning stuff. You know, we need to find out how to do it. And for me, um, what I'd my opinion, I'd say, is I think everything should be given back. Mm -hmm. You know people shouldn't be too concerned about where it's going to land. Mm -hmm. Because look at the context she gave us. He was in the middle of his ritual, you know, when he was disturbed and the result was what it was, you know. So some of these artifacts, some of these objects are for the shrine, you know, they're religious, you know. Even if it's not conventional Christian or Muslim, it was still, there were some of them are still religious artifacts, mm -hmm. you understand, and there's a respect that should be given to that, irrespective of anybody's beliefs, mm -hmm. you understand? So for me, I'd say that it's a conversation that is important, it needs to be had. Please don't forget the Open British Council that needs to be sent to me. Um, <laughs> it's a conversation that needs to be had, you know, and um, we're happy, quite honestly, to participate in the conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and we're happy to influence if possible. Um, restitution, decolonization, mm -hmm. and the return mm -hmm. of whatever artifacts it is wherever, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes you have to remember that as uh, we're not a government organization, but we're not uh, a private entity as well. Mm -hmm. you know, we're a charity and we're funded by British mm -hmm. taxpayers, mm -hmm. you know. So there's a sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You understand where you need to straddle it very gently and very carefully so that all of the other good work you know that is being done will not be undone at all but british council is in a position of support mm -hmm. it's in a position of support it's a position of conversations it's a position of let's start to do it unfortunately we don't have um let's say direct access to the museum we can't say oh, give us ten thousand pieces back but we can you know, have the conversations in the right place. Mm -hmm. You know, have the right people in the room to say, okay, let's talk about it, and you know, let's start doing something to, to, to make it better. Thank you. That's that's great. Because I mean, I think as we're as we're having this conversation now, we can know how important that sometimes it's just being able to talk to the right person, right? So sometimes it does even you acting as a bridge to be like, okay, maybe this person had already read something somewhere, but just to be able to have this direct conversation can probably make a big difference. 
next year, you know, we have a thousand bronzes in the, in the room. But no, but thank you very much. And I think, you know, this idea of how it is that we, we sort of make these bridges and have these conversations is something, conversations is something that for you, Matthew, I'm also thinking about because I, I don't know if anyone knows. I mean, I, I know Matthew from the internet first. Right, I know Matthew from from Instagram. Um, you know, when I was in Amsterdam, you know, definitely during um, the the you know during and start in 2020, you know, just sort of like looking at the work that Matthew was doing. But I think even before that, because I've always been um, you know into queer spaces, understanding what's happening queer activism online and in in on, in person, I I had been following Matthew's work, and I think. You know, as a Jamaican who you know comes from this country that everyone is—I mean, it is very homophobic, um, but is also specifically known for being homophobic. I've always, um, you know, and the idea that there is there is a sort of way in which I'm going to say blackness, but of course, Africanness and queerness are these sort of separate. Um, if we also go back, right? If we're here in present, but if we also go back. There are ways in which we can find queerness, um, and there are ways in which that kind of queerness also, in some sense, was 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 less stigmatized than it is um, in the present. So I wanted to ask you because we're talking again about restitution, restitution through objects, restitution otherwise. How do you also think this conversation can also involve conversations about different ways of being, multiple histories? multiple sexualities as well when we talk about um, restitution. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Tristian. Um, when we talk about culture, um, some of the definitions I've uh, had uh, this evening are very, very um, one direction. And uh, it's just, OK, way of life of the people. What if we bring it to? a group of people in a particular community? What if we bring it to like, okay, culture of women, culture of LGBTQ people, culture of this, culture of that? Because we are all in a society, but our ways of lives are like very different as different people because of the various identities that we possess. So uh, going back to history, I, I wouldn't say, um, homosexuality, queerness is on Africa. I, I really don't like that that uh, sentence anymore. It's too like European, white for me. So I would say, uh, what are we doing now to queer those histories, right? They exist in that nature. But due to uh, the colonial project, that, uh, as we all know it, uh, a lot of these histories have been whitewashed or they've been given new names or identities. They've been studied in various ways that are away from their true nature. I mean, um, if you check some like studies of Actifat, some of them really have, just looking at them, you know, this object is very queer in its nature, but the way they are read, will be like something else entirely. So how do we go back to history and start putting things in their proper positions? And uh, acknowledging the fact that also as queer people who are working in this field, sometimes we don't have that sense of direction because we don't know the past, right? And it's not because this, this, this life we are living did not occur in the past. It's because they've been washed away. They weren't documented at all because of cis heteronormativity. Yeah. So what are young people doing currently? What are people generally doing currently in this period to take us back to history, to queer up these figures, to queer up these objects, to properly read them in their nature. What are they doing? And uh, I love the work of uh, Zaoli uh, so much because she's doing this through the lives of queer people that are living now in this age. And talking about objects too, we see um, the, 
the statue of Maulisa. And if in, I, I think Maulisa is in um, Cameroon. No, no, yeah, it's in um, Kotonou, yeah. We see that statue, and uh, if you really examine that statue, uh, they call it like a transgender statue because there's the, a non-binary statue because there's the male side and there's the uh, female side. So if you read an object like that in its queer nature, you get to understand the position of Africans when it comes to uh, queerness, queer culture. Also, uh, there was a paint, there was a um, sculpture found in uh, in Zimbabwe with the Zan people, San people of like two men. Um, I, I, I won't even call them men, two people who have similar gender, like uh, Odin ants. So if you really, really study that object in its own nature, you get to understand at that time, right, what was going on with all of this. And um, so we are not left with so much to work with in history. So what we are doing now is to queer up those history with our lives, uh, making our bodies the archives and uh, just putting it out there for people after us to really, really know how rich uh, our culture is when it comes to like queer expression. And I also see it as our very nature. Thank you, and, and, and thank you so much as well for pointing out um, the way in which we can find the queerness in objects directly, but it's also about just sort of like queering the histories that we have been taught and that these histories have been, it's not necessarily that we are trying to find things that weren't there, it's that these things were deliberately taken out because of the sort of cishet normativity um, that came also with the European um, colonial project. So thanks for that. And I think, you know, thinking about, you know, when you think about masquerades, for example, right, one of the, we've been talking a lot about Benin bronzes, but of course, like a lot of the objects that have traveled the world are also, as you said, spiritual objects, objects that have been used in masquerades. And a lot of these masquerades objects are gender bending, right? Or have been used, definitely are used um, by men to represent women or, you know, in that sense. So um, it's, it's really a, a great way to also think about queerness through these objects that are traveling through museums or that have been held hostage by um, international museums. So. Yeah, thank you for that. I used to write my use of hostage. <laughs> yes, they are held hostage. Uh, but yeah, but thanks for that, for that. And you know, Fizayo, when I when I thank you again for for the sort of ethnographic and storytelling and way of thinking through things, I also wanted to, you know, and and also link to what Matthew was saying about how we're connecting the past, but also creating in the present, looking towards the future, right? Like what kind of stories will be told about the present? And as someone who is also in the art sector, you know, I, I have to really ask you as well about objects now, right? And how do objects now also relate to objects in the past? Um, and so I, I'm curious, you know, as I, I find the MSC Shillon Museum to be a fascinating one. I, I've been telling everybody, yes, you have to go. It really is a museum where you can get like this idea of art throughout Nigerian history. But at the same time, on the lower floor, you've been curating these um, exhibitions um, for the MSC Shillon Museum. I'm curious what kind of connection you see between the sort of like global interest in African art now and the sort of you know global interest then, of course, but that we're, that's not being reflected as restitution in African artifacts, or as, as we call them artifacts. Do you, do, do you sort of think about that relationship? I do. Um, my work with YMC Shillon looks at the past, the present, and makes suggestions for the future. So I don't superimpose a future on the audience. I tend to drop a seed where their imagination germinates and answer for themselves. So we are independent thinkers. And I think the educational system in Nigeria, and I must say this as a caveat, I didn't go to school, or I did until um, GS1, so junior secondary school year one. 
and then I left for 10 years and came back. So a lot of how I think is not very Nigerian, right? And so it, it um, permits me to give the same freedom to the audience that may otherwise have been marginalized through their own school of thoughts and re, um, gives the independence back to them. So looking at the past, um, speaking about the present and opening a gateway to the future is usually the three-fold chord that my practice is based out of. Um, but then I remember studying Cubism, Pablo Picasso, and I was so heartbroken when I realized that he didn't even acknowledge that his inspiration, the inspiration for a whole movement called Cubism came from West African masks. And it made, me, it made me look at art and what was produced differently. It was a thing of pride for me to know that the bedrock of an entire movement that swept the length and breadth of the Western world was rooted in my own culture. Um, and it's in sharing with whoever, whenever, however, has access to me. Because I think a lot of these things are also marginalizing because of the access. Um, and I do my own little bits to try to push information out. But it's, um, it's a daunting task. And you can't carry everybody's matter on your head, as we say here. So I use the vehicles of education and entertainment, literally synonymously, because as I'm trying to open the mind to think for itself and think independently, I'm also entertaining you. So at least you might remember that story that he was performing a royal act. And you might remember the story that actually, if somebody came in to my home and overpowered me and took what was rightfully my own, um, would I expect my ancestry to avenge me? Um, and so I think in opening your minds and dropping these seeds, I hope that they germinate independently but that is exactly what the storytelling does. It's to balance the equation. It's to um, try to understand the links that were not said, to ask the questions that perhaps were overlooked or, as Matthew said, whitewashed, mm -hmm. and to contextualize in this day and age. Right? We have a roof over our heads. Mm -hmm. What was the kind of sheltering that was needed back in the... Um, indigenous era. I hate to, and I'm coining my own vocabulary in explaining certain things because to say there was a pre-colonial pre West Africa, it is still giving credence to the colonial era. Mm. And so these are indigenous people that were, that were immigrants or migrants. They moved from place to place on trade. Um, they followed the pathways of the water, right, with their cattle rearing and um, and their fishing, or whatever it, it is that the cultural um, anchors were at that point in time. And so I try to move away from what is the status quo mm -hmm. and to ask questions based off of my own understanding of my genealogy. My grandmother was an Adirid Thai dyer, mm -hmm. um, and, so, and she happened to go on exchange programs in the, U, in the US right after Ladi Kwali. Now, I know of Ladi Kwali and I know of my grandmother, but a lot of people in the Nigerian art history context do not know about her. And that's what the foundations of the Invincible Hands exhibition, the first one I did at Yamisi Shelon, were inspired from. Um, and in trying to reappropriate and to label correctly these histories, I think they will first start from our own personal experiences and us asking questions about our our formation, how we got here, um, why we're not speaking the language, our understanding. If a Yoruba boy or a Yoruba girl was taught in Yoruba, would they excel? If they're given the same conditions through which um, learning should be, should be exchange, an exchange of learning should happen, would they thrive? Or am I having to learn a language superimposed on what my own cultural fabric is? And so it's kind of like releasing you and freeing the audience to go back and to connect the dots and bridge the gaps that exist in their own personal histories. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, when you talk about these gaps in personal histories, um, I have to take it now 
to maybe my personal history, um, but in some sense, um, sort of representing a broader diaspora, um, right? Because when you talk about, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's always interesting to be here and see the ways in which this erasure happens like within this, the country context, right, or within the nation context, and to know that colonialism is so strong, right, that even here, you know, you can have persons who aren't able to speak the language, but then, of course, you have the second set, um, which are, who are persons who are forcibly removed and d did not have the language as a part of, of um, their own histories um, after, after having left um, the continent. And you know, one of these, one of the questions that I have in mind is, in some sense, this conversation about restitution feels like a conversation for here, right? Um, but on the other hand, you know, if we're talking about restitution, we could probably even think about restitution of people as a, as a possible restitution. That's a very, that's another very thorny topic <laughs> to be thinking about, like, because what do you have to put in place to restitute people, right? Um, in you know thinking of re repatriation in that sense, um, but I, I I am I, and that is something I'd love. We could t have another conversation about. But I think I'm I'm curious, Brenda, about you know we think <laughs> you know blame the British or but we can definitely blame the British reality, right? Like it, you know blame colonialism. This is something that in some sense you have a nation that. Um, multiple nations in Europe, but now within the Nigerian and for me a Jamaican context, we can, can center um, Britain. Um, what, what kind of role do you see Britain possibly playing also in not only um, sort of the restitution argument in terms of objects here on the continent, but also in connecting across the diaspora? Right, so because that in itself is also a restitution, right? So it may not be about physical movement of people, but it may be about bringing people together in different ways. Um, because that, that in, in fact, Britain in the same way in which it splintered us is also very much in the position to bring us back together. So what are the ways in which you, you could see that maybe happening? I'm still going to go back to the way we work. <laughs> and I think, um, when I, the more I explain, you know, you can now see that it's um, deliberate mm -hmm. in the way we work. So I do creative economy, my colleague in Kenya does cultural response, and my colleague in South Africa does cultural, uh, wait, creative economy, cultural response, and I don't remember the exact <laughs> word, but it is an exchange of culture. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the three um, pillars that underpine all the work we do in the arts and at British Council. It's the global model, mm -hmm. you know. So for cultural exchange is exactly what it is, mm -hmm. you know, where the opportunity to build these bridges, especially with um, Africans in diaspora. Mm -hmm. So to speak uh, for Nigeria, it would be looking for opportunities for us to work together. Mm -hmm. And the primary mission of the British Council is to connect to connect people around the world with the United Kingdom. That's the basic mandate, you know, and that those connections come through a myriad of ways, um, education, exams, schools, um, arts, you know, and so cultural exchange is the vehicle that we use to do that. And because it's the arts, it's really broad. So sometimes it's films, it's music, Sometimes it's an actual knowledge exchange. Sometimes it's really about just going to meet these people where they are and then coming, you know, here and all. So that's the biggest vehicle that we use to do that. Of course, um, there are other projects that um, the UK does in terms of like the Arts Council and all of that. And then there's all this grant work that they do as well to encourage um, international artists. So there's like a very, it's focused. There's a focus for it, and it's something that we do. And um, for people who have benefited from those experiences, you know, for example, I'm going to use my story. And look at this story I can tell. <laughs> so um, when I started in the arts, I started as an actor, then I moved on to producing, <clears throat> and then um, festival making. And my first experience of festival making was um, an opportunity given by the British Council mm -hmm. where uh, we were able to start making a festival called the Lagos Theatre Festival that you read about. Mm -hmm. And then 
I did this exchange. You know, I went to Brighton Fringe, and I think that experience singularly um, kind of cemented my decision to stay in the arts. Mm. You know, working in the arts in Nigeria is, <laughs> is hectic, for, to be polite. <laughs> it's the wild, wild west, mm. basically. And so um, doing that exchange actually made me say, okay, 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 this is it, you know, I'm stopping here. And this will be, you know, where I'll, you know, pitch my tent and, you know, kind of move this career. To be clear, that was my second career. Mm-hmm. I had done a full career in banking, you know, so moving into uh, the arts from such a very formal, you know. And so that exchange, you know, and I met, oh my God, you know, I don't know. And it's not anything, but it, Brighton is like a cultural place mm-hmm. and it's, such a melting pot for every kind of person. Mm-hmm. And I mean every kind. Think about it there, there. You know, and it really just reinforced new narratives for me. Mm-hmm. You know, like my idea of what white people are, because I had to stay and work with them, mm-hmm. you know, and understand them and try and get them to understand me. And I built very beautiful relationships from that one experience that have transcended. It's 10 years now, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that um, that is one testimonial, you know, from that exchange work and how that has actually cemented a career for me like that. So there are a lot of people, you know, who enjoy some of those benefits, uh, depending on sometimes budget, you know, depending on um, what's going on at the time, depending on what's going on in the world as well. So it, it depends on what the focus is, you know. There's also a program that we do in Edinburgh every two years. It's a culture program, but it's focused at policymakers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hosted by the, by the city of Edinburgh, and it invites all of the ministers mm-hmm. in all of the countries where British Council exists to talk about cultural policies. And as much as we're here, for lack of a better word, down here doing the work, people are putting out you know, creating all sorts of magic, creating all sorts of art. If the policy doesn't favor Mm -hmm. the artist, you know, it won't work. And sometimes it's the most boring part of what we do, but it's very important to, you know, sit down and have this conversation, to say, the world's moving in this direction. Nigeria, come along, you know, Ghana, come along, everybody come along. And, you know, this is how we're going to work, Mm -hmm. and this is what we're going to do. So those are the kinds of ways you know, that we're looking at connections Mm -hmm. for me. And I think it's very important. Like I said, it might be not so interesting, Mm -hmm. you know. So there's the exchanges, there's knowledge exchange, there's knowledge sharing. And even the work I do in creative economy, you know, um, it's the biggest portfolio we have along in the arts, Mm -hmm. you know, what we do in terms of um, the support that a lot of artists get. And more often than not, it's a sharing of expertise. Mm. And, you know, you have people of African descent, you know, who have established themselves in the UK. They're working in, you know, established uh, industry. And then we do this exchange where they come, mm. you know, and they work mine. And then all the time they try and collaborate and create some kind of work and all of that. And I recently started a showcasing program. Mm. So it's, it, it's wide. And a lot of it can be... Um, attributed to my personal experience, mm-hmm. but there's a framework in the British Council that allows that personal experience to become part of the work mm-hmm. you know, that um, exists. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, I, I was also wondering as well, and bringing Matthew and Fazayo in, just to also answer the same question somehow. Um, because I, I, you know, from Brenda can give the straightforward, this is what we're doing um, across um, the UK and also Nigeria and the rest of Africa and the way in which it hopefully it spills into like the Caribbean and then elsewhere. Um, but I, I'm curious to know what you both think can be done um, or could be done even more um, from these international institutions that have their, you know, in some sense that have a strong um, role in the, in, the, in the art sector here, in the creative sector here in, in, in Nigeria. Now we have the, um, 
the British Council, but of course we have the Gould Institute, right? We have Alliance Francaise, we have other um, European institutions that if we think again about restitution otherwise through culture, through the arts, through histories, through knowledge, uh, restoring of knowledge. Yeah, Matthew, you have so much sort of international collaboration experience. I'm curious to know what do you think can be done as well or even further by these institutions? Okay, um, I will just give uh, a bit of context the work I do. So uh, I am the founder of Obodo. Obodo is a youth-led organization that uh, aims at uh, educating the general public about LGBTQ issues through art and tech. And our focus for this year is very much on art, uh, establishing a space for queer arts and artists to thrive, um, and also a space for residency uh, from all over the world, uh, where we have artists from all over the world come into Lagos to interact with uh, queer art and queer artists. So uh, the objective of all of this is, as I said earlier, uh, to queer history, right? So if we have like materials that uh, we could reference to, maybe when uh, our leaders come up with um, queernesses on African and decide to make a law, just say, okay, this is the material for you. And um, yeah. And also, uh, somebody mentioned Elin um, as people who are currently criminalized, I mean, in this space. Uh, we deal with trauma and also the violence uh, that occurs on the streets, uh, on queer bodies everywhere. So we have to like deal with this and just find a safe space for us to uh, gather and uh, just share our own thoughts. So this space, we serve as that, uh, that place that you can come into and uh, just share things with communities. So uh, for me, in the ways uh, the international organizations and communities can help, I don't know, I feel like I've been talking so much about this and uh, it just ends here because nothing happens. Uh, nobody wants to be affiliated with you as an LGBTQ person in Nigeria or organization. And uh, it's so sad that um, instead of also thinking of creative ways to support this organization without the government really knowing it, uh, people are not just interested at all. So you have to cast your net to, okay, countries outside, like cast your net to organizations outside this country, right? And uh, some of them still give you strict requirements and then you'll be like, okay, I'm in a place where I can register my organization as an LGBTQ organization and uh, one of your requirements is like registration to get fund and it's so complicated doing this work in this place and um, I don't know what to say when it comes to like support but then if you are really interested, uh, you will reach out. I think it's quite a broad topic. Um, and to niche down would be almost like saying that we should niche down the conversation on repatriation. From my experience, um, there are different agendas and we need to be very careful um, within the boundaries that we can play in and the ones we can't interfere with. I think it was Wale that had mentioned an injection of funding um, into different ideas that creatives have from corporate and independent bodies, so non-governmental, like private, the private sector. Um, I think cultural institutions such as the British Council, and Gothe Institute, um, and the um, Alliance Francaise also have an agenda. They have a cultural agenda that they must safeguard. Um, that's fundamental to whatever programming they're going to push out. And so, Onos is on the creative, or the creator, to find the boundaries through which they can play in 
um, to push whatever their own narrative or their agenda or their philosophies are. Mm -hmm. I think if we go in like a bull in a china shop wanting acknowledgement, it's more destructive. And there's a soft power that comes with how to speak in such spaces and how to propose certain ideas in such spaces. Um, a lot of my work came from asking questions, as I said, because I knew that my in individual context left a lot to the imagination. Mm -hmm. And so I went in as a learner. I literally was not schooled or taught in any of the proposal writing that finally landed, you know, a book that was published for Lagos culture and was endorsed by the state. This is literal walking in blindly and learning on the job. Now, what I've failed to do and what I'm working on um, doing is to look back and show the templates that has worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, not because, it's not because I want to gatekeep, I'm not a gatekeeper. If you ask me a question, I'll tell you the answer as far as I know and give you the bridges that you need to get to, you, to on your own journey. Mm -hmm. But it's the time required to stop what you're doing because I have an agenda and I have a trajectory that I'm trying to build toward. Mm -hmm. And it's stopping whatever I already have going on to say, oh, actually, no one's walking behind me. Let me create a class, for example, and share this information. And so knowing that I haven't built enough bridges mm -hmm. with the work I'm doing with the MC Shillon, um, it's self-funding press conferences mm -hmm. and it's self-funding um, transportation to the museum, which is far away, and to not yet have the conversation to draw down from for assistance mm -hmm. is to show that on my own merits, I have been able to do these things and so if you don't give me the, the funding, I'm still going to do it myself. And so it's better that we partner together. And I think a lot of what these um, institutions are looking for is for you to test your own concept and not to use their taxpayers' funding to run a hypothesis. And so I think these are the lines through which we need to play in, understand, and um, triumph through. Interesting. It feels like you're sitting in my head. <laughs> That's because when he was speaking, I was just thinking, soft power. Soft power, Matthew, soft power. You know, and politically, um, you can, you, I don't go into this myself. <laughs> politically, yeah, politically, you can look at the definition of soft power in relation to how the British Council, the Good Times, the Jews, the Asians, is how they work, you know, as soft powers. And that in itself will give you an answer to how we're sensitive around um, LGBTQ topics in countries where there's policy and law, you know, for example, in Nigeria where it's criminal. Mm -hmm. you know. But we have a very robust um, response to LGBTQIA as the British Council in general. Um, we've been funding something called Five Bones of Freedom, you know, for the longest time. And basically, they're made by LGBTQ filmmakers mm -hmm. around the world, you understand? You know, but we're not here. Just imagine the headlines. You know, imagine the headlines. And as I said, soft power, you understand? She said it's so articulate, you know, she said everybody has their own agenda. You understand? So, we have to, um, we're building connections, like I said, our primary mission is building connections. Oh, our primary, sorry. Our primary mission is building connections. So you didn't catch all of that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, you know? So we're building connections, which is the primary mission above everything else, you know? And sometimes some agendas will not help you build connections. And then when you're asking the question, who asked you to do it? You understand? You know, be, you contextualize everything to your country where you are, you know. And so, um, we're very inclusive. We have, in fact, a mandate to be more inclusive, you know. And inclusivity, like I said, is for different communities. She said it so well in terms of kind of 
for lack of a better word, picking your battles, you know, and deciding the strategy for the battle and how it's going to come across and embedding your own agenda, you know, inside of that and all. I said so many things without saying things, but um, please, no, we're happy you. to talk to you, Matthew, happy to. That exactly is one of the purposes of this, right? When you think about restitution, restituting the conversation, right? Yeah. Having this conversation. I, when I like to hear, I'll be happy to talk to you because then it means that you've put um, two persons um, in touch. Um, I, I want to open up to the, to the room before, um, if anyone has any questions, um, let's have a conversation going as well with, with you. Um, you're here, have been listening um, to us for quite a while. So any questions? You've triggered a lot of things in my mind mm -hmm. in terms of the, the word restitution and how it's not so diminutive, it's not mm -hmm. so narrow in its frame. Mm -hmm. And um, we really need to apply it in so many different um, aspects of Africanism, mm -hmm. both historically, contemporarily, and in how we, how, we, how we envision ourselves going forward. And I think within that, there is a question what does restitution look like for you in all of you in your hopeful um, context for, for restitution um, and how do you see that playing out how do you see it, the impact on africa particularly um, and yeah i mean how where can we take this how far can we go with it um i really like your question and uh because I come from this very artistic background, you know, it informs a lot of the decisions I make. And personally, I took this job and I joined this organization, you know, basically because I was thinking around what else, you know, what else, wh where else can I be? What influence can I have for my people? You understand? That was one of the reasons when I thought about it, and this is me just saying my motivations, you know, for, for because um, it, it was a sacrifice. I'm, I'm not even going to lie, you know, but it was an, an opportunity, you know, where I was like, okay, I have all of this wealth of knowledge. Um, I think there's something I can do, and there's a difference I can make, you know, with it. And, um, it's unfortunate, you know, the world is going through this economic crisis, you understand? So budgets are just down everywhere. But every time I'm thinking how best, how much, what else, you know, can this community gain, you know, from me, from this organization. And it really motivates my planning, it motivates the way I'm delivering my projects, even the sectors, you know. When I combine that with the research, you know, that we do, because we have, you know, everything has to be evidence-led, you know, I kind of find, you know, that sweet spot. So that's what it looks like, uh, to answer her question, that's what it looks like to me. Taking myself, my time, my essence, my energy, and infusing it into this organization and seeing how much influence, you know, how much difference I can make with the power that I have? It would be to awaken the minds, um, I think, beyond, beyond the relics coming back. Um, it's to shape and reawaken the minds of what they call um, the dark continent. Um, <laughs> the Benin bronzes in the British Museum are in the basement. Um, they are very big, unsaid things about placement and pride of self and pride of place. And I think what I want to do is to allow the parallel that exists to exist um, and to put a different trajectory right beside it. So I give the audience their own opportunity to choose and to formulate their own ideas um, and to reinvest in the knowledge gaps that exist and to do the work I can to educate and I don't say education in the sense of hiding it in a book or um, in a lecture style. I think it's a bit more creative and intentional 
um, especially with the arts, that you're seeing um, a painting that was done during the slave trade, right, in, um, in Nigeria, and then you're seeing a more contemporary, that was done in the modern era, and you're seeing a more contemporary installation right opposite it, and it's speaking about migration and memory. And then I'm tying that into Jakwa. I'm sure a lot of us have family members or friends that have traveled. Um, and so I'm tying it into what is happening politically, what is happening culturally, what is happening in conversations that we can readily remember. And I'm letting you formulate your own decision. And so it's in empowering um, the minds because that is the fertile ground I choose to um, work with. It's empowering the minds of the everyday Nigerian that I have access to, and by virtue of measuring success to um, the African continent? Um, for me, it would be thorough examination of objects and uh, an inclusive uh, um, academic uh, environment, right? Uh, because a lot of these objects, they will be studied. So in studying them, um, there should be an inclusive approach to how they are seen and like using different theoretical frameworks. Uh, when I was doing my final year project in school, I wanted to use queer theory for my uh, um, project analysis, but my professor did not allow that because he said it's not acceptable. So uh, that is dangerous to academia because uh, you're supposed to see beyond uh, what is available to you. And also, uh, see this beyond your own self, because we are, we are all thought leaders here. We are all curators, we are all uh, academics, we are all teachers, we are lecturers or something. So it's very important to see beyond our own self and um, our own ideas, right? We should go beyond when uh, studying objects or just viewing the idea of restitution. And also it would be put criminalization, right? And um, using the object as tools of education, how do we educate people with this object and uh, beyond the frameworks that we are used to? Thank you so much for that question, Ebu. I, oh, yes? Okay. It's like art, activism, and academia. <laughs> Those really are like the anchors, mm. you know? And I think if we, that for me is like a big takeaway. If we can all just think of it in that context, we're gonna go far, mm -hmm. really. I think that's Thank quite powerful. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Of course I must be polite, I'm a guest, you, I, you know? I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, maybe um, you can use an example. Well, so I've been, I've been studying uh, some Nigerian art history, and I'm really interested in this modernist period, um, the Zaria Rebels, the Mbari Club. Um, and the Mbari Club is actually a really important, uh, independent um, Nigerian art association, but it's also really important because um, they published the works of writers from South Africa, from Kenya, from Zimbabwe. So it's a really important cultural institution. At the same time, uh, the Mbari Writers Club was funded by the CIA. Uh -huh. And so this is the history I think that we uh, have always had to negotiate when it comes to collaboration. That often the, the bodies that are uh, supporting us or funding us have different ambitions uh, to what we have. And so, considering that in this conversation we have you, yeah. my dear comrade, <laughs> um, but also this, com this the talk about um, um, agendas, mm. um, and of course, my dearest um, Matthew, who's experiencing, I would, it mm. seems to me like the negative mm. um, interaction with these bodies. And so, in all of this, just how do you? Um, kind of navigate this complicated field, but also make this distinction between acts of allyship and acts that are maybe asking more of you. you know? And 
in my experience, let me tell you the truth. You know, sure. when I first went to consult for the British Council on Legal State Festival, I can't tell you how many people said, how can you take their money? How can you take their money? Why? What? Colonizers, blah, 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 blah. And I said, first of all, um, there's no uh, government organization, you know, standing up to say, this is some money, go and do this work, you know. And I want to tell you very clearly that that festival, it changed the face of theater. Mm -hmm. We had all sorts of people coming out of what we would call the trenches of Nigeria, you know, to show up at that festival because we used our good sense to make it inclusive, affordable, accessible, open. This was a decision that my partner and I made, you know, based off of this platform that was created. You know, they gave us an inch, do you understand? And we took 65 million miles. And that is my um, charge to everybody, you understand? That is an opportunity for you to take an inch that was given to you, you know, and turn it into Third Milan Bridge. Do you understand? So that's my perspective, um, just to let you know that I don't look at it as, okay, am I a collaborator? You understand? You know, am I looking at it as an opportunity? And that's the perspective. And that was my response to everybody who asked me, how could I, how could I, now I work for them, you know, that how could I do this? How could I do that? How could you, you know, you know, you stand for the artists, you're the, you know, and all of that. And, you know, and I was just like, mm -mm 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 -mm. that. This is an opportunity. And you can use this opportunity as a building block, you know, and all of you can stand and raise your voices. And before you know it, you will become self-sufficient. That's what it is. You will become self-sufficient. But you have to take, especially under these circumstances where we are, you know, we have it really tough. And people say, yes, artists have it tough in general. Nigerian artists are rock stars. They are rock stars because they're doing it in spite of, despite everything that is wrong with no infrastructure and all of that. You understand? So for me, I see it as an opportunity to take an inch and turn it to the Niger Bridge, to the Third Mainland Bridge. You know, take every opportunity that you see, you find, and use it. You have to be creative. You have to be smart. You have to decide what's the narrative that you're going to you understand? But that's what it is. No, thank you very much. And I see, I would want to, because of time, um, I'd want Huzai to respond, but I saw, I saw her nodding along. For, for those who may have come in this moment, they'd be like, oh, but I thought we were having a conversation about restitution. And it would feel as if it's, if it's, as if it's not a part of the conversation. But this is such an important part of the conversation because in essence, we're talking about renegotiating colonial relationships, right? These post-colonial relationships what are the sort of like power disparities that are still here? What are the ways in which we're still restituting other things, restituting funds, right? Restituting other resources. So it, it really is important for us to say, okay, how can we really truly have as equal a relationship as we can have, even as we have these restitution conversations? So thank you so much for that. And I, I also wanted to just another point to leave us with, which also came from Ebu's question, also came from the responses, is to remember that even though we're talking about restitution, it feels like it's about the past, but restitution is really this idea of what are we imagining in the future, right? What does it really look like in the future? What do we want it to look like? And how can we actively and consciously, again, Nolan's question, work towards um, this future that we're imagining? So thank you all. Thank you so much for your contributions.